So I'm going to talk today about bananas, um, and more more specifically, software-defining system devices with the banana double-split driver model. Um, this is work with uh, Hani Jamjum from IBM, that's my manager, and uh, Hakeem Weatherspoon, who's my uh, advisor from Cornell. Um, okay, so to, to a lot of people, cloud um, pretty much means flexibility, and uh, flexibility comes from decoupling device functionality from the physical devices themselves. So if you think of something like a virtual machine, um, the CPU and the memory are uh, not too tied to the, the actual physical uh, CPU and the physical memory that are on the, the servers. So this means that you can place the VM anywhere. So you can do things like consolidation, you can instantiate it in a different place if you want, you can do migration, you can do pl placement optimizations, and all of these good things that uh, we have come to uh, uh, talk about in, in cloud. Um, but the the thing is that not all uh, resources are quite as nicely decoupled as um, the, the CPUs and the, uh, and the memory. So um, in particular, devices um, sometimes are not. So if you think about um, today how uh, interaction with devices goes, um, the, the, there are dependencies. So, um, so I'll just describe the Zen split driver model, okay? So this is the para-virtualized device uh, interaction model. Um, what happens is the guest is running a, uh, has a driver, and this driver doesn't really know anything about the hardware details of the device, it just knows something like, I am interfacing with some network device. Um, that front end driver interacts in the control domain, domain zero, with a back end driver, which somehow talks to a hardware driver and eventually talks to the device itself. So all of the physical device details are kind of managed by the control domain, domain zero. And the guest doesn't really need to worry. So this looks great, it looks very decoupled. So we can take this, this guest and we can start it on another machine and as long as we have a back end driver, the, the hardware doesn't even have to match, it'll, it'll still just work. But the problem with the dependencies is um, uh, that there are dependencies <laughs> on hardware. So if you think about the obvious case, this is that the, the, the device just isn't there on a new, on a new, in a new location. So if you were to take the guest and move it to another, another piece of hard, uh, another machine, um, you may not have a GPU or you may not have an FPG that, a, that you had before. Also there are um, things like uh, device-related configuration, like, for example, network configuration. So while the, the front-end driver may be decoupled from the hardware driver, there's, there's still some, some configuration in the network that might depend on that particular, uh, that particular coupling. So something like a, um, a, a VLAN tag that is, is uh, set for some particular port. So the main problem here is these dependencies sort of limit that flexibility. So all those good things that I listed before are limited by the fact that you have these, these hardware dependencies. So, um, and, and this is kind of, uh, kind of obvious. If you, move the, if you were to move that VM and one of these dependencies uh, gets broken, then things will no longer work. And more than that, there isn't even an easy place to kind of plug into the hardware driver that you had before. So um, this, this back-end uh, back and hardware driver combo is some uh, ad hoc mixed together um, uh, combination of, of back-end driver and hardware driver. So what we're proposing is to take the split driver model, that's this one, which is only partially decoupled, and split it again um, to make it more decoupled. <laughs> so, and that's where the name comes from, the banana double split uh, driver model. Um, so basically what we're saying here is let's take that system portion of the device driver uh, interaction model, the, the, split, the split driver, and let's split that again and make a very clean separation between the hardware driver, which we're now calling the corm, and the backend driver, which we're calling the spike. Okay, and the important thing is that there's a, there's a standard interface between the spike and core, a very well-defined interface, and, and the two things can be connected with wires, and they can be um, uh, uh, updated and, um, you know, rewired, reconfigured on, in a kind of software-defined manner. So now if you think about moving that, that guest, that domain zero, to another machine, you can think that the spike may go with it and that wire will stretch out so now it has stretched between multiple physical machines. So that, that initial kind of uh, uh, limitation on the flexibility um, sort of uh, goes away. 
Okay, so so that's kind of the high level of what we're doing. So the rest of the the rest of the talk, I'm going to give a little bit more detail about um, the banana banana double split driver model. Um, just describe some of our implementation to date, some of our experiments we've done to date, um, and then and then finish up with related work. So before I get started, um, you might be wondering what the uh, where these what these weird names are, the Corman spike and. Uh, um, I'm not an uh, expert in bananas, although I know more about banana plants now after doing this project than I ever did. Um, they, they have something called the corm, which is uh, this kind of base thing that's underground. It's the root structure of the banana plant. And then they have these flower spikes that come off the corm, and those are what uh, grow into bananas. So if you get confused in the talk, just th think of this diagram. Think back to your, your knowledge of bananas, and, uh, and, and we should be okay. So. All right, so to, to describe what corms are in our system, um, again, you think about them, they're the underground piece, right? So the corms are attached to the physical device, all right? So the corm uh, wraps the, the hardware driver. Um, corms expose one or more endpoints, and these are basically just uh, interfaces into the hardware driver, um, which look very much like virtual network interface cards. Um, the endpoints on the corm are connected, can be connected to one or more spikes. And spikes, again, are the, the, the part that is the back end uh, driver. Um, these are connected directly to the front end drivers uh, in the guest. So there is one spike per guest virtual device. Um, again, the spikes also expose endpoints, and again, these look like virtual network interfaces, and they are attached to corms. Um, using these things called wires, which I'll talk about next. And um, the important thing is that, uh, that the spikes in the corms do not need to share the physical machine. So, and the reason they don't share the physical machine is because they're connected with wires. And wires are just connections between endpoints. Um, and there can be a, a number of different ways the wires can be connected. Um, you can think of a network tunnel, you can think of a VPN, you can think of a local bridge, all depending on the environment uh, and the situation where the spikes and corms happen to be located. Um, each hypervisor contains um, an endpoint controller. It's sort of in charge of deciding where all the endpoints are, are connected. So um, if you think about each, each hypervisor, it's, it's got some spikes and some corms. Um, they may be connected to each other, or they may be connected to remote corms, remote spikes. Um, it's basically the endpoint controller is, is the, the, the name of the, the piece of the system that, that decides uh, or that manages what's connected to what and uh, sets the wire type. So if you have co-located spikes and corms on the same machine, they'll be uh, connected with a local bridge, uh, et cetera. Um, these endpoints and the, the management of the endpoints is also integrated with the VM migration mechanism. So when you are to move a guest, um, the, the endpoints are updated uh, properly so that the wire is, is in, a, in effect stretched. And really what we're going for here is, is, is a very simple interface um, between these two parts of the, the, the back end of the, of the split driver model. So we want to be able to connect and and disconnect these, these things and do that on the fly and as you move things around, um, uh, use these primitives. So when we started uh, implementing this, we first, uh, we first decided to focus on um, the network devices in Zen. And we figured that this was uh, sort of a nat natural place to start just because um, once you have uh, you know, some of this remote spikes and corms connecting to each other, you're gonna be doing network things anyway. Um, our endpoint implementation exposes uh, NetDev in Linux. Um, so these uh, these are these are the, the endpoint. It, it really is a virtual network interface, and um, the way we attach them to the backend drivers and the outgoing and the actual physical hardware, the outgoing interfaces, is by um, grafting them together with something we call an endpoint bridge. So. Um, if you look at the diagram, um, now the front end is still talking to a back end driver uh, unmodified from the normal way that a Zen a virtualized network driver would work, except now um, you have this endpoint which is connected to it uh, via an endpoint bridge. Um, the endpoint implements, uh, implements the wires. Um, when, when packets come out the other end of the, of the endpoint, um, this may be on a different machine, um, that endpoint is, is also connected uh, via a bridge or a v-switch to uh, the outgoing interface. Okay, so 
we implemented different types of wires. Um, so the we we bridge them together if they're if they're native if they're on the same if they're on the same machine. Um, we have an encapsulating wire which um, basically adds a VXLAN header to to packets, um, and this is done in a kernel module that that, that we wrote. Um, and then we have a, uh, a tunneling wire which uh, uses OpenVPN. Um, the way we configure the wires is through a, a proc interface. So again, it's very, very simple in terms of uh, setting. It's a connect-disconnect type thing. Um, we interface with proc to, um, to, to say where the other end of each endpoint is. And, uh, and we in in integrated this with uh, live migration um, by, by simply updating the endpoints um, on the migration complete. OK, so our. Our uh, goals with our experimentation, um, really what we wanted to do uh, to start off with was, was to do kind of the, the, the most um, extreme test we could think of of, of location depend independence. And so for us that was um, cross-cloud live migration or moving a VM from one cloud to another and try to keep using the same CORM, which is essentially the same, same physical device. Um, so uh, I'll describe a little bit about that. And uh, also we have uh, a little bit of uh, preliminary uh, experimentation on the actual wire performance, because the wires are sort of uh, a crucial part of, 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 this, of this whole thing. OK, so to, to be able to, to do this cross-cloud live migration, we needed a little bit of a complex setup. So we needed resources from two clouds. Um, Preferably that we're under different administrative domains because um, that's what makes it uh, uh, a little bit more of a difficult test. So we took resources from Amazon EC2. Uh, these are four times extra large cluster compute instances. And uh, also local resources. And in order to get the control that we needed on Amazon EC2, we used um, the Zen Blanket, which is some of our prior work, for a nested virtualization. So essentially what we do is we run um, a, a Zen system inside a, uh, a, a instance, uh, a virtual machine instance in Amazon EC2, and we also ran one back in our local just so we had consistency. Um, for these experiments, we didn't worry about the disk, so when we migrate our VMs, we're just using an NFS server that's in our local, uh, local environment. Um, and um, for all the measurements, we used, uh, we used NetPerf to, to compute the, the throughput and the latency. OK, so um, these graphs on this page show the, uh, the, the results that we computed from our cross-cloud live migration experiment. So um, the, the two VMs were com communicating with each other um, using NetPerf the entire time, um, just continuous NetPerf traffic. Um, and what happened was f we have the, the two VMs on our local environment. They're both communicating together. We migrate one. We wait a little while. Then we migrate the other. Um, and so what you see in these graphs is, is what happened to the network traffic in the meantime. So um, you'll see that there's a big drop in performance. Um, that's expected. Um, at that point when the, the, the drop in performance was there, um, that's when one VM was on Amazon and one was on our local instance. Um, the, the way that they are communicating is that the, the spike has, has stretched its wire out. So all of the traffic from the VM that was in Amazon is getting tunneled all the way back to our local environment before it actually gets to the other VM. Um, so you know, uh, one of the takeaways here is that it worked. Um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't really a, a small feat, uh, I guess, to to have have this uh, kind of uh, connectivity. Another interesting thing that I think this uh, kind of brings up is um, what 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 happened at the end of this experiment. So. Um, you would expect if we left the corn where it was that all the traffic would bounce back and uh, all the way back to our local environment and then back to, to Amazon. And what we see here is that the performance came right back. That's because we, we played a little trick. We did something that we call corn switching. So um, after migrating both VMs, the dependency, um, the dependency that they had on the, on the physical network was no longer there because they were now co-located and they could use a local switch to communicate with each other. So since the dependency was gone, there was no reason not to switch their corms to the local 
uh, the local network, the local CORM. Um, and you know, we see that as an example of where the performance um, was recovered. So the, the way to think about this experiment is not, um, not that, the, that, the, that the performance is terrible uh, <laughs> once you migrate one from the other. Of course it is. Uh, you have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, distance in between. But it's more like um, um, this is, you know, again, this is an extreme case, and, and there are these, these, these concepts that this quorum switching concept can be an optimization that you can then apply once you start moving things around. And so really this is another example of the kind of flexibility that we're, we're going after. Okay, so to, we, we did compute some more migration numbers. Um, and again, um, you know, for the most part, these are preliminary numbers, and you know, we haven't, we don't have a uh, uh, optimized environment or anything. Unfortunately, a lot of the numbers are um, a little bit hard to interpret because our experimental setup brings in a lot of overhead. Um, we're using this this send blanket layer for the nested virtualization, and that already increases downtime of, of virtualization or uh, downtime of live migration by 43 percent. Um, and you know the the flexibility that we're getting for doing this migration is is, is not for free. We we are migrating our migration of the banana endpoints does give a further um, thirty percent overhead. But again, um, you know the the main thing here is that um, you know we illustrated the possibilities of stretching and also the opportunities for in improving performance. And we did we completed the cross cloud mi live migration with two point eight seconds of downtime. Okay, so we also did a little bit of uh, a little bit of brief evaluation on um, on on our wire types. So, um, like I said before, we in our implementation we used a kernel module to implement an encapsulating wire, which basically put a VXLAN header on every every packet, um, and we compared this um, with a bunch of other um, uh, tunneling uh, mechanisms. Um, Really, what we wanted to prove to ourselves is that we could we could do some kind of encapsulation with with decent performance because um, anytime you have uh, you know these these uh, corms and spikes on different machines, even if they're in the same network, you're going to be doing some kind of encapsulation. Um, so uh, our results showed that you know um, our results were, were pretty good. Um, we found that we did get a performance improvement by using our kernel module. Um, the other interesting thing that kind of came out of this is that. Um, it seemed that using a kernel module was especially important in the nested environment. So again, this is kind of talking more about the, the experimental setup than the actual um, thing, of <laughs> than the actual banana wires. But um, the things like context switches are, are magnified when you're in the nested environment. So um, just uh, before concluding, um, I wanted to mention some related work. Um, so if you're familiar with Zen, you're probably familiar with uh, the block tap driver work. Um, and this is really just a different cut point. So when you have an, uh, a, a, a block device driver, um, the back end driver can be replaced with a block tap driver where you can do anything you like. Um, <clears throat> This, uh, another another piece of work is is net channel, which focuses on continuous access to devices. Um, we're really more interested in trying to get a, a programmable interface between the, the top halves and the bottom halves, and figuring out what kind of uh, controller can be built out of those, and how to um, you know incorporate things like the quorum switching and things like that into in a sort of a central brain for this. Um, there's also been some, some some specialized solutions for things like high uh, high performance network cards. So there's a, a system called Nomad, which uses uh, which focuses on these uh, kind of network uh, cards that, that sort of like people were mentioning earlier that bypass the OS completely. Um, also some some work in US, USB. And of course, another way to uh, handle network dependencies is, th is through virtual networking. So, and there's been a ton of work in virtual networking um, with VL2, NetLord, Violin, and others. So just to summarize, um, so I've described uh, our work on the banana double split driver model. And really, the goal here is to decouple the virtual devices from their physical devices. Um, and you know, ultimately, we're looking for the mappings between the vi virtual and the physical de uh, devices to be to be software defined, and those wires to be able to be plugged and unplugged, and and things like that. Um, so far, we've just looked at the the network device. We um, we picked a, a very extreme uh, extreme um, situation to to test it on. Um, demonstrated some cross cloud live migration. 
And um, you know, there's a lot of things to look at in the future. Like I said, we're, we're very interested in seeing how, uh, how to build a controller that can, that can manage these mappings and what kind of, what kind of things we can do with that. Um, also, quorum switching. Um, in the, the scenario that I described where we, where we found both VMs were on, on EC2 on the same machine and we no longer had a network dependency, um, that's really the only reason the quorum switching worked there. It seems like there is, there is, um, uh, you know, there may be a way to kind of generalize how to do the the quorum switching, um, or at least uh, for different devices. So that's something that's interesting, and also looking at other devices and other optimizations and things like that. So um, that's that's it. Uh, if you need something to remember, the the the, the system by here's the picture of the banana plant again. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Hi, it's Jonathan from Boston University. So really very interesting. I just want to ask uh, two things. One, I want to do a clarification, just make sure I can put it in the right headspace, and then a, a question. So I'm thinking about various things that have been explored, and uh, like, for instance, using 9P at the more higher level to think about you know, mounting somebody's uh, network stack, or you know, that very uh, Plan 9-like approach where you're going to turn everything into servers, you're going to mount them, and then you're going to have this, uh, all the applications written against that. So, I think the real distinguishing here is, you know, you're saying, look, we want to make sure that we're not perturbing what's running inside the, the guest VM effectively. We want it to not know that we're doing this largely. Yeah, that, that, that's right. That's right. The, uh, the guest VM, uh, ultimately, we want it to be completely oblivious to whether or not uh, a device even exists on the, on the physical machine. So I guess then on the other two pieces of work that I was trying to fit it into my headspace, and one is the uh, sort of things like uh, uh, ATA over uh, Ethernet or iSCSI, mm -hmm. where now you're sort of saying, well, no, why don't we just take it at the bus level? And if we put it at the bus level, well, then, yeah, you get the same sort of advantage. Now, I think the difference here is you're saying you just want to be more general to the various types of devices? Um, well, yeah, so we want a, a general framework that works for a lot of different types of devices. And, re and really what we're interested in getting at is, is not so much whether or not they're accessible and whether or not they're always accessible, mm -hmm. but more um, what is the right programmable interface to have so that you can, you can move things around and you can get to something that performs well. So you have the flexibility if you need it, but you, you, you shouldn't use it unless you, you know, uh, unless you absolutely have to, right? And so you can make, you know, so if you think of like something like software-defined networking, um, we wanted some, something like that, where you're kind of programming these things, you're moving the VMs around, or maybe you're moving the wires around and the corms, you're switching those, and eventually you get to something that performs well, and then you have the flexibility plus the performance. Okay, so larger than the transport might as well, I mean, you could have as well, in, within your infrastructure as the wire components, might as well, you could have run like iSCSI oh, or yeah, HA, yeah, whatever totally. you wanted as yeah, the yeah, yeah, transport. Yeah, the, the, okay, tra cool. the transport can be anything. Okay, good, so I got that. So then the last thing is what you touched on. You mentioned, so in these worlds where we are moving to a lot more hardware support for virtualization, where largely we are actually going to be doing SRI, you know, uh, steered interrupts and so on, in that world, doesn't that cause a problem because we're effectively cutting out that flexibility point because we're actually putting it directly into the guest VM at that point? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting um, uh, issue in general, which is, you know, um, even even if you think about about the the hypervisor, right, and when the 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 hardware or the hardware support for that came came about, you lose some amount of control if you're just you know if you're saying I'm not taking as many interrupts as I used to, you're losing some of that control. So the question is whether or not there can be in some of these uh, device device. Um, you know, device virtualization things, if there are like some kind of flags where you can tell the hardware, hey, every, every packet of a new flow I want to know about because I want to update my internal structures, something similar to what happens in the, in the, in the uh, you know, CPU and, and, and stuff. I think that would be very interesting to look at. Uh, in general, yeah, if you need control at the moment, then you, you, you lose a lot of that, that, that ability. So, so I think, but I think it's in general, I think it's a very interesting trade-off. Yeah, I was curious if you had um, a, a framework for the taxonomy of devices that, that need this kind of support. Uh, so it seems to me that um, you know, 
the requirement to leave something behind on the, on the previous host machine um, may be maybe tied to the fact that there's some state on that machine uh, or the fact that you're trying to get at that. There's some location you have, like an IP address mm -hmm. or so forth. Um, but, but other kinds of devices may not uh, need this separation. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a compute only stateless device, uh, maybe you don't need to. Is, is that a correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So, so if if the if the device is very well decoupled, then you know your job is done. I don't I don't see that you really want to leave things behind. Um, it's when you have these dependencies that you're trying to get around. That's really what we're what we're focusing on. Okay. And so, are there others? Uh, there's state, and there's sort of a an, an ad addressing location kind of. Yeah. Thing. So, so in the, the the kind of like big biggest way we're thinking is like there's either some kind of configuration that has to do with having that particular device, right? And this is like the network configuration case, right? Like the IP address, right? And then there's there's the other one which is just the the availability of the device. Um, and you know, in terms of an exhaustive list or, or, or taxonomy, we haven't really done that. We have been thinking a bit about um, you know different ways to kind of uh, or di or different ways to kind of dig in at what the real um, dependencies are. Because you know, on, on some devices, it's almost like you could do something like you moved and then you switch to an emulated version until you need it, and then maybe you switch back and then you start using a real version, right, of the the real hardware again. Um, you know, you might have that kind of opportunity for certain devices that may not be as performance-centric, right? Um, but in, in, in general, in terms of uh, a complete taxonomy and, and really looking in that, we, we haven't done that yet. Hi, uh, Ching Ho from IBM Research. So great talk. So I have questions about the extensibility. So for example, do we consider like a virtualization not in Gen, like we have a, like a container type of virtualization and uh, you know, the, this process type of operating, uh, the virtualization, all these things, and the, how uh, the extensible to the different hardware, so like the GPUs or these things, or how extensible it is to you know, extend your uh, the abstraction frameworks to like, different uh, drivers like uh, storage, all these things. So, so you have a thought on that, right? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, again, we haven't really looked into detail about any other devices other than the network device at this point. Um, really what we want to do is have something that's general for all of them, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, we, we haven't done any specific work on them. We, we feel like there is a way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's going to be performance uh, questions that come up for any uh, device, and those are going to be different depending on the type of device, and also the, the way the applications expect to use them is going to differ a lot. Okay. Um, but you know, we haven't we haven't gone down anything other than that. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.